This is 5 on 20 News. I'm Luke Goodhart. It's Wednesday, May 10th, and we are coming to you live from our studios in downtown Tucson. First, let's talk local headlines. According to a 2016 report from the Arizona Board of Regents, brain drain is alive and well in Tucson. The report found that a smaller number of residents who graduated with a bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona are now employed in the state. The number was smaller than Arizona's other two public universities. George Hammond of the Economic and Business Research Center at the U of A says that Tucson has a high percentage of educated retirees but lacks a high number of recent graduates who are willing to stay in Arizona. He said that the state needs to attract and retain a lot more college graduates than it has been. According to the study, only 27.5% of Arizonans have a bachelor's degree or higher, below the national average of 30.6%. In September, the group Achieve 60 AZ launched an initiative that sought to increase the number of Arizonans aged 25 to 64 with a degree, from 42% to 60%. They hope to achieve this uh, by 2030. At the same time, the Board of Regents is talking with its public universities, business and industry leaders to see how they can encourage businesses to hire Arizona graduates. In Pima County, the number of retirees who possess bachelor's degrees is higher than the national average, but only 26.6% of people aged 25 to 33 possess a degree. In comparison, the number is 29% in Maricopa County and 33% in Coconino. Out of the state's three public universities, the U of A has the highest percentage of students who come from out of state at 42.5%. However, many of these students hightail it out of the state once they've got that diploma. But Nick Ross, an economic development analyst with the city of Tucson, says that the picture is improving. He mentions the rapid development of the downtown area and new Sunlink streetcar, which makes downtown more accessible. One plan to retain students is to register them as corporations so that students can receive some of those tax credits the Arizona legislature loves to hand out. Speaking of the Arizona legislature, they may not adjourn at the end of the week as expected because Republicans are looking to pass one final law before their break. The law would require any state, city, or county tax increases to be voted on in November elections only. Legislators such as Republican Anthony Kern of Glendale says that the law will allow the maximum number of voters to weigh in on tax hikes. The law was part of a deal that convinced legislative Republicans to vote for the recent $9.8 billion budget passed last week. Other incentives for Republicans involved an additional $2 million for so-called Freedom School programs. <clears throat> which are largely funded by libertarian activists, the Koch brothers. House Speaker J.D. Menard revived the legislation after it was uh, voted down. However, Menard now believes that he has enough Republicans on board to get the law passed this time around. If the law fails again, Menard will adjourn the session, then do donuts in the parking lot with his Trans Am before hightailing it to Cabo. Sky Harbor in Phoenix has introduced a passport app that streamlines the arrival process at the airport. The app, called Mobile Passport Control, is free and allows both U.S. and Canadian citizens the ability to transmit their passport information to customs using their phones. Users create an account, then submit their information and answers to inspection-related questions once they land in the U.S. Once the information is submitted, the traveler gets a receipt with a unique code, which custom agents use to finish the process. The app eliminates the need to fill out paperwork, so the process, in theory, will move along quicker. Customs and Border Patrol say that the app has already become popular among travelers to and from Tucson. The app is also available in 21 other airports and one cruise port in the U.S. As is expected with Custom and Border Patrol, the app will not work for Muslim-sounding names and will instead work as a tracking device. Arizona's 7th District Congressman Ruben Gallego says that the firing of FBI Director James Comey sounds like a cover-up by the Trump administration. Gallego pointed out that Trump fired the leader of an agency that is investigating the Trump team's links to the Russian government. He said that the firing of Comey puts Trump in a position of worrisome power. 
Gallego said that Trump will now be able to direct the hiring of the next person in charge of that investigation. Two other Arizona Democrats, Kristen Sinema and Raul Grijalva, have also called for an independent investigation into the matter of Trump's link with Russia. Republican Senator John McCain has also joined the call for an independent investigation. He said that the president's decision to remove the FBI director only confirms the need and urgency of such a committee. Trump fired Comey a day after the New York Times reported that Comey sought more money to conduct the investigation. The Justice Department denied the Times report, then walked back that denial with spokeswoman Sarah Huckabee Sanders confirming that Comey sought additional resources for the investigation. Sanders was later asked about conflicts of interest involving Jared Kushner's family and how much money they have received in exchange for their White House connections. Sanders quickly corrected the reporter, stating that Kushner's family has received, quote, resources, which is not technically illegal because it's a different word. Governor Doug Ducey signed a bill that would expand a second chance program that gives qualifying criminals an alternative to incarceration. Currently, the felony pretrial intervention program can only be used in Maricopa County. The program allows nonviolent offenders to undergo treatment programs to avoid prosecution and prison. Under the deal, the offender would need to admit guilt and agree to make full restitution to victims. They also enroll in programs to treat substance abuse and other behavioral and health issues. With the signing of the bill, the program can now expand to other counties in Arizona, where it will be used to keep a congressman's son out of jail after a weekend bender. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about the program you're watching right now. Here at 5 on 20, we are undertaking a new kind of citizen journalism. We are going to give you the news as we see it. And we want more people to speak up with us. We need writers, hosts, anchors, camera people, sound people, the whole gamut. The times require a new way of informing ourselves. So join us. Do it. Do it now. Email us at info at creativetucson.org to get involved. And if you think there's a story we're missing, a person we should interview, an upcoming event we should cover, or have any news tips for us, shoot an email to info at creativetucson.org. We are here for you, and we want to cover all stories from all points of view. So don't be strangers. Now in national and international news, the leaders of the Senate Intelligence Committee have sent a request to the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Unit for any information on Donald Trump and his aides. Senator Mark Warner, the panel's top Democrat, said that the group was trying to find any intel on Russian connections, no matter where it leads. The committee is investigating alleged ties to the Russian government by members of the Trump's campaign team. In regards to the request from the Treasury, Warner says it was made in conjunction with Richard Burr, the panel's Republican chairman. However, Burr refused to comment about the request. Warner says that he will block Trump's nominee for the Treasury Department's Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence until he receives the information that the panel requested. The committee also sent requests to four former Trump campaign associates on Friday, asking them to turn over emails and other records of communication with Russians. This comes a day after former Assistant Attorney General Sally Yates testified about the Russian connections of Trump's original pick for National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Flynn has been found to lie about being paid by the Russian government for his appearances on the Russia Today network, which features Russian propaganda. Yates said that she had known that Flynn lied to both the FBI and Vice President Mike Pence and warned Trump about this to no avail. It was also recently learned that President Obama warned Trump about Flynn's past, but once again, Trump didn't listen. Are we seeing a pattern here? It's also reported that Trump has a growing rash in his nether regions, which he refused to get checked after Obama recommended he see a doctor. Yuck. The Senate is hanging a no girls allowed sign outside their office these days because Senate Republicans handpicked 13 men to take part in a health care committee while including zero women in the discussions. This is despite the bill having huge impacts on women's access to health care. The House of Republi uh, Representatives passed their bill last week to overturn the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, and handed it off to the Senate, who is reportedly starting from scratch on their own legislation. And it will mainly be made of these 13 men, who include Senators Ted Cruz, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, and Mike Lee. 
McConnell defended the lack of estrogen by saying the working group that counts is all 52 of us and that, quote, nobody is being excluded based on gender. To prove his statement, McConnell pointed to Janice, who he says is a female member of the committee. However, it turned out that Janice was actually Ted Cruz wearing a wig and sundress. A new report shows a 20-year difference in life expectancy based upon which state citizens live in. The University of Washington study also predicted that the so-called life expectancy gap would grow wider in the future. 11.5% of U.S. counties experienced an increase in the risk of death for residents aged 25 to 45 over the period from 1980 to 2014. Residents in richer areas of central Colorado had the highest life expectancy at 87 years, with counties in North and South Dakota having the lowest level at 66 years. The Dakota counties have high numbers of Native Americans who have some of the lowest life expectancies in the country. Overall, life expectancy rate in the U.S. was 79.1 years, an increase of 5.3 years from 1980 to 2014. In addition to the Dakotas, counties along the lower half of the Mississippi, in eastern Kentucky, and in southwestern West Virginia saw the lowest life expectancies compared to the rest of the country. Dr. Christopher Murray estimated that socioeconomic factors accounted for 60% of the differences in life expectancy. Other factors included smoking, obesity, and lack of exercise. Access to and quality of health care accounted for another 27% of the differences. Counties that saw their life expectancies fall are trying to remedy the situation by making it more difficult to purchase harmful products such as health insurance. A joint study by NPR and the PBS series Frontline found that the agency responsible for affordable housing in the U.S. is providing fewer units but costing more. The study looked into the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program and found that it's costing taxpayers 66% more than it did 20 years ago, even as it creates fewer opportunities for affordable housing. In 1997, the program produced more than 7,000 housing units, but dropped to 5,900 units by 2014, according to data from the National Council of State Housing Agencies. Industry representatives acknowledge the numbers, but say it's due to rising construction costs, decreasing federal funding, and stricter state requirements to build homes for the lowest income households. They also say that the business is less profitable than it used to be. But the NPR study also found that the program lacked public accounting, even among government officials and regulators who are supposed to be overseeing the program. The LIHTC was established after the federal government stopped building its own public housing in the 1990s when buildings were demolished after complaints of drugs and crime. In 1986, Congress adopted the tax credit to spur private businesses into building low-income housing. Since then, this has become an $8 billion industry. The tax credit is given to developers, who then sell the credits to banks and investors for cash. Developers often use middlemen called syndicators. In return, the banks and investors get to take tax deductions, while the developers get to cash in to build the low-income housing. So essentially, taxpayers foot the bill through this confusing process, but don't get to see where their money actually goes. But the program is unlikely to be improved due to the strength of the middleman lobby, run by a loan shark named Shaky Pete. U.S. military officials are considering a proposal to increase the number of soldiers in Afghanistan. The recommendation for more troops follows a review by the Pentagon, State Department, and U.S. intelligence agencies. Anonymous sources say that the increase would run between $3,000 to $5,000, including special operations forces. Uh, sorry, 3,000 to 5,000 soldiers. The goal is to break the stalemate between Afghan forces and the Taliban. The U.S. aims to push the Taliban to sit down and negotiate with the Afghan government. Teresa Whelan, a Pentagon policy official, said last week that Donald Trump will receive a proposed new approach to the war within the week. Al Jazeera's Patty Colhane said the Pentagon officials likely leaked the information about a troop surge in order to box Trump into going along with the recommendations. In the past, Trump has been critical of the operation in Afghanistan, charging the war with being a waste of taxpayer money. He has tweeted several times over the past five years of how we should end the war, although he's stopped at calling for a full withdrawal, saying that the country would likely fall apart. The U.S. has about 8,400 troops currently in Afghanistan, with another 5,000 from NATO allies. 
Most troops are taking part in NATO tra training missions, which seek to boost Afghan forces who have struggled against the Taliban since the U.S. combat role officially ended in 2014. At the same time of the proposed U.S. increase, NATO is asking that the U.K. also beef up its military forces in Afghanistan. NATO itself is considering an increase of 13,000 troops in Afghanistan, a decision that the group says will be made in June. If this all sounds like deja vu, don't worry, it's not just you. Pentagon leaders are calling the mission Operation Crescent Wind 2 Electric Boogaloo and will feature a cameo appearance by former Defense Secretary and glamour puss Donald Rumsfeld. The Department of Energy declared an emergency in the state of Washington after a tunnel containing nuclear contamination collapsed. The 3,000 employees at the Hanford site were evacuated and moved indoors as a precaution, but all personnel were found to be safe from any radiological release. The Energy Department says that a 20-foot by 20-foot section of soil caved in where two underground tunnels meet next to the neighboring uranium plant. The cave-in was discovered by routine surveillance. The collapsed tunnels contained rail cars that once carried radioactive nuclear fuel from reactors. But the department says there is no indication that contamination was released. The Hanford site is located about 150 miles southeast of Seattle and is a former nuclear production complex that's been in a troubled state of cleanup for years. The site is frequently referred to as the most contaminated site in the U.S. It contains millions of tons and hundreds of billions of gallons of nuclear waste. The cleanup was supposed to be finished in 2007, but the deadline has been extended several times. Washington State plans to repurpose the site and use it for next year's Extreme Tough Mudder competition. A recent study by Yale University found that nearly a third of approved drugs in the U.S. between 2001 and 2010 had major safety issues in the years after approval. The study comes at a time when the FDA is receiving pressure from tr the Trump administration to approve drugs faster, but the conclusions should cause some restraint. 72 of the 222 approved drugs in the 2001 to 2010 time frame were withdrawn and given a black box warning on side effects or warranted a safety announcement. Dr. Joseph Ross, who co-authored the study, which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, said that faster regulation times have consequences. Ross's team previously reported that the FDA approved drugs faster than its counterpart in Europe and that the majority of drugs involved less than 1,000 patients and, about, and last six months or less. The number of those tested and the testing time period are far shorter than what is considered to be appropriate scientific practice. On average, drugs took a median of 4.2 years for safety concerns to come to light for drugs that were approved. Issues were found to be more common for those drugs that were given accelerated approval and for drugs approved close to the regulatory deadline. President Obama signed the 21st Century Cures Act in December to speed up drug approvals by pushing the FDA to consider evidence besides the standard three phases of clinical trials. Currently, the FDA's system for reporting drug-related health problems is voluntary. These reports are not verified, and critics say that the system is underutilized and filled with incomplete and late information. But FDA spokeswoman Angela Hogue said that the agency is reviewing the study's findings. This review will likely take three times as long as most drug approvals and will later be withdrawn and replaced with a back black box warning. This was Luke Goodhart for 5 on 20 News. Next up, I will be speaking with Sandy Heath and Phyllis James of the Veterans Association of Real Estate Professionals, Tucson Chapter, about their upcoming housing summit event. Stay tuned. <laughs> Not bad for your first time.
Welcome back. I'm joined today by Sandy Heath, president of the Veterans Association of Real Estate Professionals, and Phyllis James, community outreach director. They're here to speak with us about their upcoming housing summit on Saturday, May 20th at the American Legion, post number seven at 330 West Franklin Street. Sandy, Phyllis, welcome to the studio. Thank you. So uh, why don't you give us some background on uh, the Veterans Association of Real Estate Professionals. What is it? What kind of services do they offer? And uh, yeah, what can we expect? Okay. Thank you, Luke. Um, the Veterans Association of Real Estate Professionals was established 2011, and it's a nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit organization. And the purpose of the organization increasing sustainable home ownership, financial literacy, VA loan awareness, and economic opportunity for active military and veterans. The Tucson chapter was established in 2015. So, and um, the purpose of the Veterans Association is it's a veterans program by vets and our success is measured by how many lives we change one at a time. Um, we have home ownership advocacy, we have community outreach where we have served and we carry that under VA Rep Cares. And we've helped veterans to prevent evictions. Mm. We sponsored a family providing for Christmas, holiday for five, seven kids. Um, we sent a um, youth to camp. So we've done a lot in the community in this short period of time. Um, we also professional membership. We provide um, veteran job creation and affordable housing as well. Very good. VA Rep uh, nationally has given away 18 donated mortgage-free homes to, mm -hmm. to veterans, not necessarily like the wounded warriors where they had to be wounded, just a veteran in need to give a veteran a hands up, not mm -hmm. a hand out. Mm -hmm. uh, four homes have been donated in Tucson. So we've had uh, 175 homes remodeled. We've had four million spent in rehabilitation for veterans' homes, $60,000 in a down payment assistance programs. We uh, have educated 2,500 2, veterans in homeowner uh, ownership. 1,500 families uh, have gone through the, the VA rep program. Uh, 750 veterans were placed in, in homes be, uh, in need. Mm -hmm. 6,000 real estate agents and lenders have been taught and 50 veteran housing summits, now 51. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we continue to do educational seminars. Wonderful, it seems like you have a, a lot of of a lot of variety in the programs and you've had a lot of success. So tell us more about the summit that's coming up on the 20th. Well, on our summit, we're going to have mortgage professionals. We'll have, um, home, we're hoping to have our, our um, home warranty programs, but we're going to be providing information for our veterans, how they can purchase a home loan, how they can um, go about getting housing. We want to educate them credit-wise as well as establishing home ownership. Wonderful. Uh, and how, uh, how do people get involved with VA Rep? They can go to our varep.net website mm -hmm. and they can sign up um, and we also have classes that they can take as well. So if they have an internet, they can get involved or they can give us a call as well. Wonderful. Uh, what, uh, what are the benefits that you can gain from VA rep training? Well, the veterans themselves find out what's available to them as veterans mm -hmm. um, and the mortgage professionals will help in to educate them as well to even ask when someone come in to fill out an application are you a veteran mm -hmm. are you eligible for veteran benefits so we provide that education and also to real estate professionals as well how to work with veterans and what mm -hmm. is available to that veteran find out what can that veteran um, be provided to get into that new home so it's really about uh, empowering both veterans and people in the industry exactly. to assist on both ends. Exactly, yes. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, so how, where does the VA rep get its funding? How do you guys keep your, keep your doors open? Okay, we have quite a few. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, 
by mostly local fundraisers. We have a golf tournament coming up August 18th at Quarry Pines. Oh, uh, we have uh, sponsorships from business in the communities. Wells Fargo uh, has been a very generous supporter of ours. Uh, at our housing summit, we're going to have sponsors such as Guild Mortgage, Academy Mortgage, Movement Mortgage, Farmers Insurance with G Gary Evans, um, mostly through through sponsorships and, and donations, and some of our you know we have pancake breakfasts and things like that. Just yeah. just out there washing cars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah. nice. And getting the community involved right. to support us right. as well. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. So uh, maybe just give a recap. Tell us again about the fundings or the uh, housing summit, where it's going to be, and how people can find out more about it. Our housing summit will be at the American Legion Post 7, 330 West Franklin Street, <laughs> <laughs> Tucson, Arizona, March, May 20th. Um, it begins at 9 a.m. to 9 a.m. to noon, free lunch provided. <laughs> Wonderful. And is there a website where people can go to get more information or? They can actually go to the varep.net. Varep.net. Yes. Excellent. Well, Phyllis, Sandy, thank you so much for being thank with us you. today. Thank you for having us, Luke. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Tucson. Stay creative. Thank you okay. so much.